Acts chapter 9, verses 32 to Acts chapter 12, verse 24. Last week we looked at Saul, right? Saul's conversion, as it is called. Saul, how he became Paul? No. Did he become Paul? Oh, okay. Thank you, Rex. Right. So Saul is the Aramaic or the Hebrew name. And at that point of time, because they were Hebrew, Hebraic people, yet they were living under the Roman Empire and Greek was a prevalent language. So they would have two names. You know, it's almost like a dual citizenship and they would have two names as well. So there is uh, Saul, the Hebrew name, and uh, Paul, Paulos, which is the Greek name. And here also today we are going to look at the next, pa next, next uh, person, Peter. And what's the other name that he has? Yeah, he's called Simon. Actually, Simon again is the Hebrew name. And Peter is the Greek name. Okay, so Saul and Paul. Simon and Peter. So right now we're going to talk about this transition that Luke makes from Saul to Simon. Ninth chapter 1 to 31 onwards he was talking about Saul. Now he's going to talk about Simon. Okay, so there is a change there. Verse number 32. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lida. So here we find again an incidental detail. He, the Luke says the Lord's people. So who are they? The Lord's people. What about the other people? We know that anyone who willingly follows the Lord or called the Lord's people does not mean that the Lord does not belong to others okay a, a God belongs to everyone but they chose to belong to God and therefore they are called the Lord's people so Peter is visiting some people in a place called Lydda and verse number 33 there he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years Aeneas Peter said to him Jesus Christ heals you get up and roll up your mat immediately Aeneas got up all those who lived in Lydda and shall Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Again, we find this is a repetitive theme that you would find all through the book of Acts. Everywhere you would find that they go about proclaiming the name of Jesus, lifting him up as God. Right here also we find the same thing that is happening. He is going to this man Aeneas who is down there paralyzed for eight years and he says Jesus heals you. So he is going declaring that Jesus is God, just Jesus is the deity, declaring, proclaiming the name of Jesus. Jesus and he gets up and walks. So it is not about a miracle as we always know through the book of Acts, even though miracles did happen, but you would find the focus is more on Jesus, the gospel. So there, after that, every, every place you would find a miracle, Luke would always specify saying, all those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Every time there is a miracle, there is always a great mass phenomenon that happened. And the mass phenomenon was not miracle. It was just a unique phenomenon. It was a single event that happened. But the mass phenomenon was always people knowing Jesus as God and coming and following him. So this needs to be our focus as well today that rather than focusing on miracles that we would focus on the gospel and how many people know Jesus through those things. So these are incidental details, but you would find that, that, you know, Luke is very brief in narr narr narrating such a mass phenomenon. Look at that. Almost all the people in Lydda and Sharon, you know, he's using another city or a town. He says, all these people followed him. And, uh, you know, he's just very brief. Just one sentence he is said about, talked about the miracle and he's talked about the mass phenomenon. If it, were, if it had happened through us, you know, you would not hear the end of it, right? If you go and uh, in the name of Jesus heal someone, people would not hear the end of it. You know what that means? Till you breathe your last, you're going to be talking about that. That town, I went and healed that person. There is no end to it. But Luke, Peter, all of these people, you know, keep it very brief. They don't give so much importance. They talk about how people came to the Lord. Okay. And then you would find here and uh, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room, and we know what happens there, and he goes and prays. Look at that. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. 
And then we find this became known all over Joppa, verse number 42, and many people believed in the Lord. Every time a miracle happened, many people believed in the Lord. This, is, this goes side by side. Not one thing, but these two things. And this is just a single solitary event, but this is a mass phenomenon which happens every time. And one more thing I want to, you know, look, I want you to, again, an incidental detail, but I want you to look at here is that, you know, these people are called many times disciples and rather not not believers. Look at this. The disciples heard that Peter was in leader. And again, one more time, we would find that Peter, as he performed a miracle there, people came to him. He was in leader for some time. He always stays there, stays there wherever there is a proclamation of the gospel. People come to know Jesus, and that's not the end of his duty. He stays there. And this is a biblical pattern that you would find all through the book of Acts. Meaning, who's a believer? A believer is someone who believes that Jesus is God and a disciple is someone who makes a choice to follow God, follow Jesus, know him more and proclaim him. So there is a difference between a believer and a disciple. These were not just believers, they became believers, but then Peter stays in, you know, Lydda, and then you would find that they have become disciples. Later on also the same thing happens. Even in Joppa, after, you know, he had healed or he had brought to life this woman called Tabitha, Great many people followed him and great many people believed in Jesus Christ. They became believers, but he stays with them and he disciples them, making them understand Jesus, making them follow Jesus. It is beautiful. So we would find a lot of places that uh, there is a word which says the Lord was adding many to their number. Okay, what does it mean? The Lord was adding many people to the number? Because I remember, you know, when, when, when I got into ministry, someone said to me, you know, it's not about your skills, it's not about your talents, it's about how many hours you spend on your knees. And that is when God will fill your church with sheep. And I said, that's a very dangerous thing, right? You get the idea? Yeah. You don't want sheep, right? There is nothing wrong with prayer. In fact, you should pray. But prayer is not what brings people in. It's about how, you, how well you understand God, how well you, under, you proclaim it out there into the world. Yes or no? So the Lord added to the number, meaning they were not just sitting there. They were proclaiming the gospel. They were teaching Jesus. They were making disciples. And therefore, the church grew. Therefore, you know, people in the congregation, people in the kingdom, you know, the numbers grew. So we need to understand what is that called? When people did that and it is attributed to God, what is that called? It is called? metonymy meaning yes god is sovereign but at the same time they are the ones who are actually involved in making a change in the lives of people so instead of saying lord i pray for someone you that's what we do you what do you do yeah you save that person right if he doesn't need your prayer to save that person does he will he not know that the other person is not saved if you had not prayed for that person what do you think when you say, Lord, save my neighbor, save my family member, right? Yeah, it's a passion, it's a desire that you do have and you share it with God. That's good. But at the same time, that's, that is not what causes that person to be saved. What really causes that person to be saved is that you actively... You proclaim the gospel. Help them understand Jesus. Yes, we are all saved by the grace of God. Without his grace, we, none of us are saved. Yet, we have a responsibility. So let's not put into the hands of God and say, Lord, you do this. You know, what we are saying is that, yeah, we should have a pa passion that our nation, our state people need to come to God. But at the same time, we need to be careful. We need to take responsibility that all of these disciples were not sitting at their homes, you know, praying for Jopa, praying for Lida, praying for, you know, all of these people they were out there in the place going and proclaiming the gospel so we need to be doing that if we are disciples we are not called to be even making believers are we even making believers i think even that is not happening right how many of you have how many have believed jesus because of you raise your hands 
You need to be making disciples. That is what these people were doing. So as we look at the book of Acts, this is something that we learn. You know, sometimes our mind is so fixed on various other things that we have forgotten the kingdom. But these people did not. Everywhere they went, look at that. He went, he goes to, he heals Aeneas. He stays there. A lot of people are uh, being uh, believing in Jesus. He stays there and Lydda disciples them. Then he goes to Joppa. There he heals a woman. You know, a lot of people are coming to God and he is staying, staying with them and making disciples and one more incidental detail as you look at this you know Luke is giving even more more importance as we as he's talking about Tabitha to what she was doing she was always doing good and helping the poor and he she he goes on talking about how the widows were distraught by the death of Tabitha they come to Peter and say you know these are the clothes that Tabitha had given us he doesn't give that much importance to the miracle itself did you find that he goes on narrating how well she lived her life rather than spending time on talking about the miracle. That in itself should tell us the focus of Luke where miracle is not as great as a life. It's not as great as proclamation. Okay, So what we find here is Peter knows what he is supposed to be doing. He is making disciples. He is a man who understands the mission that Jesus had called him for. The ministry of Peter. Uh, what about us? Are we learning something through this? All of us are saying we are disciples. We are followers of Christ. But we need to be making disciples. You know, At least with our friends. At least with our acquaintances. From now on, think about that. You know, how can I present the gospel to them? You know, let it not be about miracles, okay? So miracles, as I told you, if it happens, praise God. But if it doesn't happen, it, doesn't, it should not be deterring you from preaching the gospel because gospel needs to be presented in whatever means, in whatever circumstance that is there. You know, use every opportunity to present the gospel, not just making believers, but also making them disciples, helping them to know Jesus. For that, you need to be a disciple first. For that, you need to be knowing Jesus first. Very important. The ministry of Peter. Then we move on to the 10th chapter at Caesarea. I'm going to read it. So look into your Bible. Chapter 10 at Caesarea. There was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him and fear what is it lord he asked the angel answered your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before god now send men to joppa to bring back a man named simon who is called peter he is staying with simon the tanner whose house is by the sea when the angel who spoke to him had gone cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants he told them everything that had happened and sent them to joppa so here we find that there is a shift in scene it was talking about peter in Lida, peter in joppa and now you have a different scene altogether. You know, it is talking about Cornelius, a Roman centurion. You know what a centurion is? He's, he's in the army. He has a hundred people uh, under his command, kind of, right? He's a centurion and his regiment is called the Italian regiment. And you would find this is a godly person. And again, you know, Luke, as he writes this, how is he defining this God-fearing man? He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. And the NIV beautifully, you know, extends it there. How does he, how, what makes him devout and God-fearing? He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So again, you would find that dual relationship. We, we talked about that, right? What is that called? Unilateral, bilateral, nothing strikes a chord. Okay. I mentioned this like two, three sermons back. We talked about that Christianity is a bilateral relationship, bilateral, uh, it talks about bilateral relationship and most of the religions talk about uh, have a unilateral relationship, it's always about God and me, God and me, but Christianity or rather Christ or even the teachings of the Old Testament always talk about me, my brother and God, me, someone else and God, me, the community and God, it's always that triangular relationship, it's called a bilateral relationship. Some of you look at me as though, you know, I'm saying things that I've never told you before, right? When Luke is saying Cornelius was a God-fearing man, he, he qualifies that statement by saying, how is he a God-fearing man? How is he a devout man? Because he was being generous to the poor, meaning that he was talking about, because all the disciples, even though this man had not really understood Jesus, somehow he has got an inclination towards Judaism, and somehow he has understood Judaism even better than most of the Jews had done. That's very surprising, because he has not known Jesus yet. And Peter 
Peter is going to come and preach and preach Jesus to him. But he, he has got an inclination towards Judaism and somehow we have no idea how he's got that exposure. But he has understood this bilateral relationship. He is generous towards people, meaning he, is caught, he understands the concept of the kingdom where it is about equality. And he has also got that relationship with God, praying to God, giving to people. So a devout man there and now he has got a supernatural vision. The angel comes to him and says, so what is this all about? It's more of a supernatural guidance than a supernatural interference. There are two different things, right? Intervention would be breaking your free will or negating your free will. And a guidance would be just leading you to make a choice based uh, uh, using your free will. So here, you know, he's got a vision and why does these things happen? It would happen only in the early stages of, you know, the establishment of Israel or even the church. So do we have to look for visions for God to guide you? I think today we don't have to. You know why? Why? Does God have to come and say to you that in a vision, in a dream, some angel comes to you and says, do this. Why we don't have to do that? How many of you ask for visions? Lord, give me visions, give me dreams. And every dream you have to go to God and say, please interpret that dream for me. Right? Why couldn't he have just said it without a dream or a vision? Why, do we, why, why shouldn't we be thinking about visions and dreams now? Yeah, we already have the revelation through Jesus. So we understand that God has revealed himself through the scriptures. And in Jesus, we have the fullest revelation. And we have understood Jesus, supposedly. And therefore, we don't need any kind of a new revelation. Yes, but at that point of time, Cornelius, this was a man who had no idea about really, not a proper idea about God. And it, the, the, the church is at its infancy. And someone had to guide him because people were not there. And God is doing that. Not that he cannot. Maybe if you are in a place where the God gospel has not reached and God could do that. But let's not focus upon these supernatural things. But what we understand is that, you know, he was guided and he understood that guidance and he go, he takes a, or rather he is sending some people there. And what is happening? The next part is very interesting. Look at chapter 10 verse 9 onwards. But about noon, the following day, as they were on their journey in approaching city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened, about, happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. And while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. So we know the story, what is happening. Here is an interesting thing. Where we talked about the ministry of Peter, let's talk about the mindset of Peter. Right now, why is this vision happening? There is a sheet that comes down from heaven, from the skies, and in that are all kinds of animals, right? And for the Jewish mind, some of them are unclean, impure. I should not touch them. God says, kill and eat. And this man says, I've not touched anything unclean till now. And God says, what I've made clean, how do you call? Unclean. What is really happening here? And Peter goes on explaining that later on as well. You would find this is the typical, you know, Hebraic mind. Where for them, anyone non-Jewish is still inferior. And look at this. It is very interesting. Let me tell you. You know, chapter 11, you know, as all this has happened, we'll come back to chapter 10 again. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard about the Gentiles. And how, how have they, they have received the word? So when Peter went to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said to him, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. What is the accusation that they are giving? And they are supposedly the circumcised believers. And they tell Peter, they ask Peter, why did you go? Two accusations. Why did you go to an uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcised man's house. Why did you go to a Gentile's house? First accusation. Why did you go and eat with him? The second accusation. Who are these guys? They are supposedly? Who are they? Believers. Yes, they are Christians. They are believers. 
And you would be asking the question, did they even know Jesus? Because this is the accusation that most of the Jews put against Jesus, saying that you are going to be with the sinners and you are eating with the sinners. Remember that? And now, people who are, you know, who have believed in Jesus, I think they have not become disciples yet, they are accusing Peter of having gone to a Gentile's home and having eaten there. This is the same mindset that Peter also had according to his own admission where he says, I also had the same thing, but I had this vision of, what is that? Yeah, the sheet coming down from heaven and God said, what I have considered pure, how dare you call impure? And Peter says, I have understood this, that I have been a man of prejudice. I have been a man who is putting, who has been putting people down. I have been a man. And God says, as he gives the vision, vision, do not hesitate to go. Meaning that this man is not wanting to, he had no problem going to Lydda. He had no problem going to, uh, to Joppa. Again, Tabitha, Hebraic name, a woman from the Jewish background. He has no problem helping and being there and things like that. But when it comes to Gentiles, he has a problem. He doesn't want to mingle with them. He has got a prejudice and God had to teach him. Even though he's a wonderful man, he was a wonderful minister, but his mind had to be changed. His mindset had to be changed. What about us? Just think about us. As Christians, how many of us have superiority complex? What about uh, your understanding of caste? What about your, your take on, you know, the class system? What about your take on, you know, the racial prejudices that we do have? Huh? What, about, what about rifts between the poor and the, and the rich? How do we look at people? Just tell me. When you see a person who is dressed really well, how do you treat them? Do you treat a, peop a person who does not have any of those things the same way you would treat this person? We all have prejudices. But if you are a follower of Christ, we need to take away those prejudices. Even a powerful man, a wonderful man like Peter had to go through this you know, mindset change. God helped him to have that mindset change. Again, it was not an intervention. It was just a guidance. And Peter had to use his free will to make the decision. So it is not going to be forced upon you. God is not going to force it upon you. But maybe understand the heart of God is a heart that does not have prejudice. And Peter says that, I understand that he has no favoritism. Peter says that we have understood he has no favoritism. And can we have favoritism? Can we look at, you know, different races and people of different groups differently? You look at an, a, a person who doesn't have an a, a education uh, differently than you look at a person who's got some education. What do you think? Isn't that us? Shouldn't we treat, be treating everybody equally? You know, this is the message that we find here, that Peter had to change, his mindset had to change. And uh, may God help us that our mindset would change, that we would be like Jesus, have the heart of God, that we will have no biases, no prejudices. You know, if we do, then we are not the followers of Jesus. You know, if you look at, uh, look at, look at uh, Peter, you know, I'm just going to verse you know, chapter 10 again. Peter is going to Cornelius' house now. Peter went in and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. So he is very clear there. I have come here not because I like it, but because God told me. The same gets repeated in chapter 11 as well, very interestingly, where he says, Verse number 17, so if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? What is he saying? He's still not saying, I'm very convinced that, uh, that they are equal. He's saying, God has said so, how can I stand against him? Okay, yeah, it is progressive. And even later on, we find that he has a problem with, the, or Paul has a problem with Peter. You know, they fight, you know that, right? They had a quarrel. Why? 
So you find that in, in the book of Galatians, you know, uh, where, uh, where Paul would uh, talk about that, how Peter, you know, he was kind of there with the Gentiles. You know, again, Gentiles is not a very good word for us to use, right? And today we need to stay away from words like, uh, you know, unbelievers and, and, uh, and uh, Gentiles. And in Tamil, you know, you, and some regional languages, you have a very, you know, very negative word. Please don't use such kind of words to, you know, put people down. You could say that those are people who do not believe in Jesus Christ or you could say a non-Christian or something like that which does not have a connotation but Gentile again you know would mean that just like the Anglo-Saxon called other people you know what they called other people uh, barbarians they said they are all barbarians anyone who's not an Anglo-Saxon an uh, English right the roots of English they said they are all barbarians this is the Jewish mentality Gentiles no Christian mentality unbelievers right May God help us that we will not have this. So here, later, even later on, Peter still has that and he has to still progress. And yes, we, are all, we all need to learn and slowly progress towards that. So we are not trying to find fault with Peter. What we are saying is that he, even his mindset had to be changed. What about us? Do we have all of these kinds of things in us? The ministry of Peter, the mindset of Peter. And now, chapter 11, you would find he goes on explaining this to the, to the crowd there. People in Jerusalem because you know they are much more powerful and he has to be acknowledged by them and they are asking him a question and he goes about giving this message and they also now whether wantedly or unwantedly they say so then verse number 18 when they heard this they had no further objections and praised God saying so then even to Gentiles God has granted repentance that leads to life so what is he what are they saying very condescending. That's the right word. They're saying, okay, they also receive the same thing. Okay, let's accept them. So it is not a full-hearted thing. But we need to grow up from there where we are able to treat everybody equally. So this, he goes and gets the message across to the people as well. And if you have understood this a concept of equality, you need to be preaching that as well. Whether Peter did it wantedly or unwantedly, that is beside the point. But he went and carried that message across to the people. The ministry of Peter, the mindset of Peter which needed to be changed. And that was not just the mindset of Peter. It was the mindset of the whole Jewish community there. And he had to go and take that message across saying God wants you to do this and therefore you cannot stand against it. So if you understand equality you need to be a person who goes to other people who do not understand and tell them, teach them about equality. If we do not have this then we have no right talking about Jesus. We have no right talking about his kingdom because his kingdom is all about equality. So may God help us that the message will be t taken across. And uh, then you would find what is happening. Chapter 12. I'm going to jump a couple of passages there. Chapter 12. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death by his word. When he saw that this met with the appro approval among Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison and handing him over to the guards by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So after this, what happens is Peter was in prison and somehow again, miraculously, he, uh, the angel, an angel appears in the, in the prison and he is saying, get up, Peter. Quick, get up. Verse number seven, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And then we find in verse number 11, Peter came to himself. Till then he was thinking that he was in a dream. Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from, the, from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. So you find Peter's miraculous escape. Peter, the, the, uh, his ministry, his mindset, how he takes the message across to other people. Now we have a miraculous escape that happened for him. Why did this happen? Why was he delivered from prison? You would also, in the same sentence or the previous sentence, you would find that James, the brother of John, was killed, yeah, was killed by Herod. Why Peter was uh, made to escape when James was not? What do you think? Because Peter was a better man. Jesus liked Peter more. 
This is a question that should gnaw our hearts, right? Where, as I told you, that is why we should not be dwelling on miracles. We should not be dwelling on, you know, God's intervention. Why does he intervene? But we know that he doesn't intervene because of any selfish reason or because of partiality. If at all he intervenes, it's, it's for his greater purpose, maybe based on his omniscience. When we talk about that again, we have the question. If he knows that, uh, you know, Adam and Eve would uh, still sin, why did he even create them? Right? These are confusing questions. But the point is, we should not be attributing, these are things we might not understand, maybe in his omniscience he knows that, uh, you know, Peter is going to do something great. We have no idea at all. He made a choice there. Right? But will he, should he make a choice for everybody in our lives? You know, should miracles happen in everyone's life? It's a question that we need to handle. Because, he, I mean, James was killed, right? And Peter is uh, released. Why did that happen? You know, is God partial? Hmm? Why should it happen? If a miracle happens in your life, praise God. Hallelujah. No doubts there. You should be very happy about it. Be excited about it. But... Maybe never demean people for whom a miracle did not happen. This is something I want to insist. This is something that I want you to learn. Miracles are not based on, well, some people say, you know what, the church was praying for Peter and therefore, you know, God delivered him. Then what about uh, uh, James? No one prayed for him? Huh? What do you think? It's not about your religiosity. It's not about your piety. It's not about, you know, what about the people who got healed? Aeneas, who's this man? Was he, did he have a lot of belief that man, man, other people did not, that did, other people did not? At least darkers we find that she was a good woman. Some information is given. Yes, he was, he was, he was made to escape. He was miraculously rescued. But if that happens, you need to know that you have a greater responsibility. Hallelujah. Instead of saying, oh, a miracle happened, you know, because of my prayer, because of my thing. If a miracle happened in your life, be a much more responsible person than other people are. This is something that you need to understand. And I think Peter understands that. And later on, this is not about, you know, whose life is better. You know, because as I told you, you know, God can save everybody, but he does not or he will not. Because that is not how he operates. Because, you know, he, for him, he has given us free will and all of those things. So he cannot go, in, he cannot go about, you know, doing miracles for everybody if he does it will be done for his own glory but if it happens in your life yes Peter was miraculously made to escape the prison he was miraculously brought out of the prison but he need to have understood the greater purpose or rather the greater responsibility that he had because when other people are not there when he is there he needs to take it and that is what we need to understand today if you are a recipient of a whatever blessing whatever miracle maybe someone else did not have that at all you know, instead of saying, oh, that's because I believed, that person did not believe. Instead of saying, I'm more holier than that person. You know, instead of patting ourselves on the back, know that you have a much more, much greater responsibility resting on your shoulder. And if you do not fulfill that responsibility, what is the point of that miracle happening to you? And after all of these things, you would find, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. So everywhere you would find miracle, Persecution, prison, death, but the word kept spreading. This is the message of the book of Luke and even this passage. And Peter, this is what Peter had understood. So this did not stop him. Yeah, he was put in prison. He was miraculously made to escape. But that does not mean that, uh, okay, yeah, uh, uh, God has made me escape. And therefore, I'm going to live my life in a very you know, happy manner, not uh, having any responsibility. He takes up the responsibility. And then the word of God is spreading even more and more. What about us? Through us, miracles Miracles don't happen, whatever it is. How impactful are we? You know, did you think about that? You know, when I was thinking about this, I was going through, you know, the, the statistics of world population at uh, the time of Jesus. And they say, you know, the, the highest uh, estimate would be around uh, 300 million. 300 million in the whole world. Okay? And uh, that's the uh, highest, uh, uh, what's that called? Projection, right? Uh, some people say around 180, 240, 300 million, the max. And we find how many people were with Jesus? Maybe around 120 people later on, day of Pentecost, right? And today we have a, uh, uh, we, we ask the question, you know, the, the world has, uh, the population has exploded so much. You know, today it's around maybe 7.5 billion or something like that, close to that, right? If you make a calculation, it's 25, 25 times more than it was 
in AD. Don't we have 25 times more 120 people? 120 people were able to penetrate into most of the you know, societies. How many people do we need, I think? 120 into 25 times. 3,000 people? Today we say the population explosion. We can't have in roads. The same calculation with 7.5 billion, the same, if it is the same ratio, yeah, we might have different challenges. But 3,000 people, if they are really disciples of Jesus, would be able to make inroads into every society. What are we doing is the question. How many, how many, how many lakhs of people we do have in Chennai? How many, how many lakhs of people, I don't know, in India, how many people we have? How many of us are disciples? We always talk about miracles. We always talk about this should happen, that should happen. My belief should bring this. We have become a self-centered group of people. May this help us to understand. Peter, everywhere, discipling people. Yes, he had a problem with his mindset and God had to teach him. And then he had to carry, take it over to other people and the message gets across. But ultimately what happens is, even you know, in whatever happens, he's in prison. He's miraculously made to uh, uh, get out of prison. If it is something that happens to you, praise God. Stephen did not have that uh, uh, privilege, right? Or rather, I don't know whether, whether to call that a privilege or not. Stephen, as he was being stoned, was not miraculously made to escape by God. But still, he ended up evangelizing. He ended up making disciples. Paul, how long did he live? He was at last beheaded. You know that, right? And as Paul is writing for a prison, you would understand his heart where he says, he has this dual mind. Or rather, we were, we are not even able to, through his writings, not able to understand which is better for him. It seems like he is saying, if I get killed, praise God, I'm going to be with God. And that for all practical purposes, when we read some of the writings, you would understand that was more, uh, um, more pleasing to him rather than coming out of prison. But he says, but again, I would also like to come out of prison because then I would be a blessing to you so that I can evangelize more, I can preach the gospel more. Look at the heart of these guys, right? It's not about when I come out of prison, I'm going to you know, stand against all my enemies and pray over them and you know. No, I'm not going to tell them how victorious God had made me. No. If I come out of it, I don't want to come out. I want to, be, if, it, you know, if I'm gil killed, it's okay because I'll be with God. But if I don't get killed, it's okay. I'm going to serve you. This is the heart of a disciple. What about us? How immature have we become talking about? Not that you, we all have problems, okay? We all do have problems. We all you know, think that, yeah, God has to perform a miracle. Praise God for that if he does, all right? But take Become a much more responsible person than you are today. That you would be instrumental in taking the gospel outside. Let it be in prison. Let it be out of prison. Let it be in death. Let it be, you know, life. Let it be whatever it is. If I'm not able to do that, what is the point of me being a disciple? Let's bow down our heads and look to the Lord in prayer.